Welcome to another episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. I'm your host, Mike Moore, and I've got a really exciting guest with me today. We've got Connor Landgraft, co-founder and CEO of Echo. Connor, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for bringing me on the show, Mike. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Echo's gotten the name out there quite a bit in the last couple of years, but for those of you that don't know, uh, they were the first to create an AI-powered smart stethoscope to detect heart and lung disease. So what I thought would be a good way to start the show, Connor, would just to be to have you maybe just as a co-founder, tell us a little bit about how it got started. I know it got started back in, what was it, 2013 in Berkeley, but if you can just give us a little backstory there, that'd be great. Yeah, happy to. So the Echo story does start back a few years ago at Berkeley at Cal. It started out as a little bit of a, a class project or, or an academic project focused on trying to understand common medical technologies and how physicians use them in clinical practice. And there's nothing more common, nothing more ubiquitous and well-known, I think, than the stethoscope. It's the world's most common medical exam done on the planet. We do it with almost every single patient. And it is that like very first line assessment that you do along with vitals to help understand the patient's status and just general cardiac and pulmonary function. And so what was fascinating to us was that while it is so ubiquitous and just so popular and, and, and done the world over, it's still very subjective and it requires a lot of operator skill, a lot of clinician skill to be able to hear those subtle differences. And there's massive variabilities. I mean, we looked at the clinical data and you find that like some providers are really good at it. You've seen a lot of practice and or had a lot of practice and seen a lot of cases. And then there are others who just don't necessarily have that confidence with the device. And so we got really excited about the potential to deliver consistency, objectivity, and, and just kind of some interpretation, some kind of AI tools that could help make the stethoscope a really supercharged, powerful first line cardiac and pulmonary exam that could help deliver better care to patients. So we, as, or as, as we called it at the time, we called it Shazam for heartbeats. Um, if you know the app Shazam, <laughs> yeah. does music identification, yep. we said, hey, heart sounds, heart sound identification. Long sound identification, that there's a need here. So that's a great analogy. It's interesting that you say that it started off as a school project, just wrapped up Phil Knight's book. I don't know if you've read that shoe dog, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, Blue Ribbon Sports, which, which ultimately you know became Nike, started out as a business school project down at Stanford. I think there's something so great about school and, and company formation right out of school. It's it's a time when I think for many people, they have the opportunity, the cost of failure is really low when you're coming out of school. 100%. Especially, you know, grad school or MBA, you, know, you don't necessarily have a track in front of you. And so the opportunity to like strike it out on your own, you probably have a better network of support and mentorship and, and industry connections at, on a campus than you do probably almost anywhere else. So it does feel like there's a big opportunity for people to kind of take bold risks right when they're leaving the nest. 100%. It's a breeding ground. And you just also, you don't have the responsibilities you have later in life, typically. You don't yeah. have typically a wife or, you know, a bunch of kids running around mouths to feed. You know, you, you can live on top ramen and mac and cheese for a couple of years if you have to, uh, to chase a dream. So yeah, it's definitely a breeding ground for that. You know, I like to, I always like to get into the use case, but, but I guess before we get into it, too much into that, I guess... That one of the statistics that I was I came across when I was re researching this is eighty percent of abnormal heart sounds overlooked. Is that the traditional metric across the board? Eighty percent of abnormal heart sounds are go undiagnosed through traditional stethoscope diagnostics. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's different data here, but the data is consistent in that there is a massive misdiagnosis and kind of misdetection of common cardiac conditions with the stethoscope. Some stats say that physicians are maybe 40% accurate at detecting it. Some of them say, you know, that results in up to 80% of cases being misdiagnosed with the stethoscope. But regardless of what, you know, the specific statistic is, there is very clearly a lack of accuracy, lack of consistency with that stethoscope. And, you know, it's, it's not a knock on the providers. It's really just a, a very challenging diagnosis to make. It requires you know, tons and tons of pattern matching, tons and tons of repetition to be able to do well. You know, you think about the people who have perfect pitch in music or, the, you know, a musical ear or something like that, where they really have that knack for understanding music and, and musical notation. And I think in many ways, like listening to heart sounds is not that dissimilar from that. It requires just a ridiculous amount of training, 
being able to hear those abnormal sounds over and over again to really train their brains to be able to do that well. And for many providers, they just don't see enough cases to, to do that accurately. Was that the kind of the, the aha moment where you guys were like, yeah, this is there, there's definitely something here? I mean, I think just the fact that you know, if you trace back the origin of the stethoscope, so the, sto- the story of the stethoscope goes back to a French physician. It's the mid-1800s or early 1800s, I should say, excuse me, around 1820s. And this French physician is, you know, even medicine at the time knew that there were abnormal breath sounds and lung sounds and abnormal breath sounds and cardiac sounds that would indicate disease, that you could hear crackles in the lungs. Okay, crackles are associated with fluid. You could hear wheezes that would be indicative of narrowing of the airways. You could hear murmurs, pitch, you know, high pitched sounds in the in the heartbeat that would indicate that there is a structural defect in the heart. So even at the time, even two hundred years ago in medicine, it was like, okay, very clear there are right. indicators of disease here. But at the time, you would just literally take your ear and place it up against the chest of the patient and and try to hear the sounds. Obviously, that's not yeah. <laughs> not very you know user friendly in most yeah. situations. Efficacious. And yeah, exactly. Especially yeah, if, if you're in a contagious disease environment, not the best hygiene. Right. And so this doctor uh, named Rene Leinick just took a w- piece of wood and hollowed it out and basically made a dowel that was hollow and stuck it up against the ear of the patient. And that helped funnel the sound to the <laughs> to his ear and he could hear better. And then you look at the stethoscope of today and that's it's it's rubber, but at the basic level, it's a hollow tube with a little piece of metal at the end that helps you kind of channel the sound. Yeah. It's not drastically different. Yeah. Yeah. And even just like hearing heart sounds, like getting the sound to be loud enough is a big challenge. I mean, depending upon the patient, their their body anatomy, there's a lot of things. They can also have really diminished heart sounds or breath sounds in certain situations. So literally just hearing the sounds in an ICU with monitors going on in the background, beeping, intubation machines, like there's just all these noises that make it really hard to for the provider to hear the patient's heart sounds or breath sounds. So even just being able to like, isolate and amplify the sound makes a makes a big difference to that provider's confidence. Well, yeah, and it, you think about it, it, probably the patients that are the most sick, maybe they're overweight or whatever. Those are probably the most difficult patients to under to hear. So it's exponential issue, I would think. You know, what you're talking about is, is, is really what I find, and I've said this on a number of shows, what I find the most fascinating about digital health is people think that it's like, AI and MI and or ML and and big data and precision medicine and it is all those things don't get me wrong some of the most transformational products in digital health are where people took the most simple device and just brought a digital component to it it's there's rapid adoption you can really transform health equity with products like mm-hmm. this if we have time I'd love to get into that because I mean you think about sending a doctor over to Uganda with a bag full of these or, or a team of doctors with a bag full of these stethoscopes and mm-hmm. you know there's things that are capable they're capable of that they would never be capable of before this is one of those technologies that was kind of what drew me in to want to have you on the show was just I love it when people take simple things and make unbelievable and you guys have definitely done that here so you've kind of touched on a brief explanation of the product, but can you get can you go into, you know, how you guys are using these AI ML algorithms for early detection? What do you have approvals for at the moment, and and then what's pending? Uh, what are you guys working on? Yeah, absolutely. So the system itself is composed of some parts of the hardware system and, and some software capabilities as well. So you could think of it as a combo of of hardware and software. The devices themselves are digital stethoscope and ECG devices. So it lets us do a very comprehensive, very quick capture of the key cardiac data streams. So we can get uh, a rhythm strip from the patient. We can get single lead ECG and understand how the heart muscle is contracting. And then we can also understand through the heart sounds, how the valves are opening and closing in the heart and how the blood flow is performing. So does it get an ejection fraction? That's one of the, the AI pieces that we're talking about, yeah, is, is the ability to actually estimate some of those measurements like ejection fraction. But we get the electrical and the mechanical sides of the heart from the hardware itself. It's, it looks like a stethoscope to some extent. We have, you know, it looks a little bit futuristic, I guess you could say, but, but at a basic level, it is that stethoscope that the physician can carry around and put in their scrub pocket or wear around their neck. And so it's very accessible, easy to access and easy for them to do those exams. And then on the software side, it all runs on a mobile. So either a tablet or a phone that sits next to the provider when they're doing these exams. 
that provides a visualization of that. So they see the rhythm strip, they see the heart sounds in real time. And then we have the AI interpretive layers. There are the algorithms that have been trained upon a very large data set of heart sounds and ECG data that can help identify diseases. And so we have indications on the AI side for identifying structural murmurs associated with valvular heart disease, doing arrhythmia assessments, so identification of AFib, um, some basic assessments of heart rate, so bradycardia and tachycardia. And then we have an algorithm in development that lets us do a prediction of whether a patient likely has low ejection fraction or an impaired, a weak heart pump, weak heart muscle, and the ability to actually kind of flag that and say, hey, there is early signs or even asymptomatic patients who, ha- who do have weak heart pumps and who are in early stages of heart failure. Wow. That's incredible. So how does that work? You know, when they buy the stethoscope, do they automatically just get access to the software or is it like a software as a service model? What's the commercial model? Yeah, in in many ways, I think like many software packages, you have your free tier, your limited access tiers, and then there are the tiers that require the subscriptions. And so we have the same thing with our platform. We allow providers to record, visualize, do some of the basic interpretations, the AI as included as part of the purchase price of the device and included in there. So that's the free tier, we say. And then we have more kind of enterprise capabilities or institutional capabilities where we'll go to a health system and help them deploy early disease detection AI, as well as the devices, the infrastructure, the training, the program development, so that they can improve the way that they do early cardiovascular disease detection within their clinics, within their primary care practices, their urgent cares, uh, kind of those really frontline care settings that we can help enable them to really focus on early cardiovascular disease detection. Yeah, it's unbelievable the amount of patients that slip through the cracks, or maybe they don't get identified, or maybe they don't fall under specific guidelines for, you know, like uh, some sort of structural heart disease. The mortality of those patients two years out is almost identical to the people that are in that classification. So to be able to identify where those patients are at and then flag them and follow them and yep. ultimately, I got to think this is when I mean, we can get into it in a, in, in a bit, but I got to think this is something that insurances have been all over in terms of readily reimbursing because the, the sooner that the, you identify those patients, those heart failure patients that are dripping into the system every month, yep. they're ungodly expensive to manage you know, in perpetuity and it's, there's no end to it. Once you're in heart failure, you're usually, you're, you're a patient for life, as they say. What's the commercial model for you guys? Is it total direct to consumer? And, and are you are targeting to uh, strictly to, you know, healthcare providers? Or are you selling to systems? How does that work? Then? Yeah, there's two sides to the model. So there is, one of the interesting things is that the stethoscope is surprisingly one of the few medical devices that physicians or providers typically purchase out of pocket. It's something that they own. It's their, their personal stethoscope. Right. We sell those directly to the providers. They can purchase it you know, from our website. We go direct to the clinician. And that's a, a sizable chunk of that market is that direct clinician side of the business. And then there is a institutional sale as well, where we sell telemedicine capabilities. We sell the early detection AI capabilities to large systems. And then we work with them to deploy them at scale across their organization. And so that's what we call the enterprise side of the business. But there are two different commercial motions. Uh, But what's been, I think, really exciting to see over the last few years is that they feed each other and that when we have a really large installed base of providers or of MDs at a health system using the product already, it then enables us to leverage that. Yeah, value proposition to health system. It's, hey, we, these devices are already here. Whether you like them or not, they're being used right. in your system. How can we give them intelligence and uh, unlock the AI capabilities such that you can standardize, measure, and deliver that higher quality uh, disease detection opportunity? <laughs> it's a little bit of like a, almost like a bottoms up sales motion to some extent. Yeah, yeah, grassroots. And when did you guys start the commercial process? From what I've read, I mean, I was shocked at the number of users you guys already have. I mean, you guys have done an incredible job. When did you start selling? And it's like several hundred thousand doctors that are using it now, right? Yeah, we're we're in several hundred thousand providers across a wide variety of specialties. It's been a good adventure getting that to scale. We really got our first product to market in 2016. It was when we really launched the first version of that digital stethoscope device. And it's been about five and a half, six years in market now, but we've made a lot of kind of iterative improvements to the platform. And I think the last two and a half, three years have been where we've really started to hit a meaningful inflection point. 
Yeah. So talking about FDA approval and starting your commercial process, the regulatory side of this business has been heavily dynamic, right? It's ever changing almost on a daily basis. Can you give us some insights into kind of what the best practice AI ML considerations that the regulatory channels incorporated into their approval processes when you guys went through it, which is interesting because mm -hmm. you went through it pre-2016 and then maybe in comparison to, to, to today. I'd love to, to hear more about what you think about that. Yeah. So the AI side has been actually relatively new for us. So we, we the way we sequenced it was we built, launched the hardware first. We said, now let's get the hardware into clinicians' hands and then use that to help seed a lot of the innovation on the AI side as we build yep. our data set. And so the AI story for us has really been within the last two years, uh, two and a half years. It's still a good amount of time, yeah. Yeah, the FDA is still wrestling with what is the appropriate way to regulate AI algorithms. I think one of the kind of incessant, one, one of the unsolvable, I think, challenges with machine learning algorithms and, and regulatory agencies is that machine learning is best when it can be updated over time as more data is captured and then you can, it's not unsupervised, but that you're able to release new models on a relatively frequent basis as you identify areas where it doesn't perform well as you add to the training data sets. But of course, you know, the FDA process is not built around serial <laughs> submissions. It's built around, you know, bi binary zero or one, one big slug, and then you don't make changes or, or those changes are very limited that you can make. And so I, I think that's kind of a, a little bit of a challenge. The FDA is uh, working to think about new ways that they can try to enable serial changes after a regulatory approval. And so they're designing kind of change control plans that they want to allow companies to do after an approval and say, hey, you can make changes to your machine learning algorithm as long as you follow this protocol and as long as you do this validation. That's is letting go of control. And I, I don't think that's something that the FDA does lightly. Uh, and right. so they're really trying to figure out like what's the, what's the right approach here that balances both sa patient safety, device performance, as well as you know appropriate controls and oversight. It's been interesting to wrestle and you know have some conversations with the agency and, and you know try to come to a place that it serves both the best interest for patients and allows products to innovate quickly. I think the FDA has done a I'd say a good job of providing guidance around hey this is the quality of the machine learning algorithm you need to be focused on. You need to make sure that you have appropriate holdout data sets and test data sets, you know validation data sets that you can't mix those two. You right. can't, there's, there's this kind of you know, concept of machine learning of overtraining or overfitting, where if you train it too many times, then the algorithm just starts to like learn the data set. And it right. doesn't actually learn the real underlying condition. It's just learning this specific data set. I think the FDA has done a good job of trying to, you know, build appropriate rules there such that they can hold companies accountable for real good quality algorithm development. You know, they're learning it, it, like any new technology regulators are always going to be behind the curve I mean, you have to have the innovation and then the regulators have to kind of catch right. up and try to figure out how to, how to manage that. It's been good to see that the agency is open to also the concept of black box AI algorithms where, you know, we, we have this big problem in, in machine learning, which is discoverability. Like how do we figure out what the algorithm is actually finding the signal in? And uh, there was a lot of worries that the FDA was going to require a ton of effort to try to like explain exactly what the AI algorithm is looking at. You can't pinpoint that. Yeah, exactly. You can't pinpoint exactly where the signal is, which is a little bit scary, but, <laughs> but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It is a little bit scary, but, but it also, um, you know, if you have to go back and try to explain exactly where, what the AI algorithm is finding, you miss out on the opportunity to, to see some of the more transformative work. Um, with machine learning algorithms. So the FDA is, I think, taking a pretty good approach there. You know, it's almost like the people that are in your shoes are almost teaching the FDA as, as you know, because at each of these circumstances that people are bringing forward for F for regulatory approval, a lot of times it's first in class, right? And they've never seen anything like this before. So was there a little bit of like, you know, them teaching you like, hey, here's what we think needs to be done, but also like you teaching them, like educating the customer on, hey, here's why we think it needs to be like this. Were they open to that kind of back and forth or what, what was the relationship like? There's different processes that the FDA has. So, you know, not to get too far in the weeds, but there's, yeah. there's classes, of, there's, there's a 510K class, which is designed right. for 
products that have pretty well-known state standards that you can reference, you know, okay, this is an ECG machine. This is, these are the specs that the ECG machines need to have to perform well. So those are relatively straightforward. And then in this de novo category, this is kind of completely novel devices that there really don't, aren't really good standards or specifications that we can look to, to help guide the product development process um, are the ones where I think the FDA is um, really trying to answer some of those foundational questions. Like what should the standards be for a product category like this? You know, I think they're definitely open and learning from industry here, which is good. And, and they've had a number of kind of uh, listening sessions with industry players as they've been trying to educate themselves on machine learning and AI tools. But, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, we, we just did a validation study on a, a submission that was more than 3,000 patients. And so uh, just a massive data collection project to prove that the algorithm worked, as we said it did, and really demonstrate compliance. And to do a regulatory submission for with a three N of 3,000 patients is kind of unheard of. Right. They're definitely not taking a uh, they're taking a very conservative approach still with a lot of these AI algorithms and really making companies do a lot of work to demonstrate um, the safety and, and the efficacy. This is probably the question I was looking most forward to asking. Product roadmap wise, I don't know what you can get into and what you can't, but are you guys looking at any other, like what I would call like nominal instrumentation and, and digitizing it like you did with the stethoscope? Is there anything else you guys are looking at? Or is uh, are you gonna stay focused on this and just broaden the the applications of it? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. And I, I can't talk too concretely about it, but. We definitely see that there are a tremendous number of non-invasive signals that are coming out of our bodies, especially on the cardiac and the pulmonary side that are just scratching the surface of. And I think the doorway, the threshold that we get to cross with these products is when we can move from just human interpretation of these signals to you know machine learning or, or digital augmentation of the interpretation of these signals. And I think it can breathe an entirely new life into how we think about it. I think our, our, our box is that, hey, these diseases can be detected by heart sounds. You know, there are heart sounds that are associated with X, Y, Z conditions. And we're already starting to say, hey, that box actually changes a lot. It grows a lot when we sure. allow machine learning algorithms to help provide some of the interpretation of this data. We can listen or we can kind of capture signals that are beyond human sensing capabilities. So, for example, we can listen to low frequency heart sounds that are inaudible to humans because they're too low frequency. We can capture those with these microphones and, and sensors and then provide interpretation of that as well as we can you know, interpret ECGs and see extremely subtle signals or a combination of signals that are you know, in many situations just too challenging or too complex for the human eye to perceive. So all, all that to say, we're big believers in mixing and matching, combining signals in really new ways. And I think we've done that with ECG and heart sounds. We've made them something that one device can capture for the first time. And when we stick those signals together, then it just opens up a myriad of new possibilities for different types of, of disease detection. We've been really cardiac focused as well. And I think in the long term, we're excited about the opportunities in the respiratory and pulmonary space. Sure. The lungs are, you know, produce sounds just the way that the heart does. And those are very indicative of respiratory conditions, asthma, COPD, pneumonia, they're just very signature respiratory acoustic biomarkers. And we're excited to kind of build tools for those too. So I, I think our, I would definitely say with total conviction, our product development pipeline is extremely long. And it's really a matter of finding the places where there are really meaningful problems that we can help clinicians solve. Yeah. And I think there's this, there's this constant battle of like, what is interesting scientifically? Um, what is a really cool correlation, what's a really cool machine learning algorithm, and what solves a really important clinical problem that um, improves patient care. And, and those are not always the same thing. You know, there's super cool AI algorithms that you can build that don't really make a difference in patient care and, and identifying the right ones that, you know, do impact patient care in a meaningful way. That's a mouthful. What you just said, right, that last statement, I can't tell you how many physicians I've talked to that have said, don't just give me data, give me insights. Right. And there's yeah. so many of these AI ML algorithms that can be built that can capture all kinds of data. But if you can't tell a physician meaningfully how that's going to meaningfully change their, their, their practice, the way that they, you know, their yeah. treatment path for patients, 
then they don't want to hear about it. They're too busy. Right. They don't want to hear about it. And it's, it's, so it's clear you've been listening to your customer uh, because that is definitely a common theme out there. Um, I guess last question I'd have for you is, is, is there anything else out there like this? You know, I, I think we're pretty unique in the approach that we've taken. And one of the, you know, I think if you look at the landscape of other companies, thin AI for cardiac conditions, there's a lot of companies focused on maybe just the AI tools um, or, or just the machine learning algorithms, and they're building those to ingest uh, data from off-the-shelf devices. There's there's definitely companies building digital stethoscope products, of course. There's other digital stethoscopes on the market. The approach that we've taken, and, and the one that I think is extremely time-consuming and, and really expensive and uh, complex from a, a validation perspective, from a go-to-market perspective, but is, hey, you need to own the hardware, the software, and the algorithms, and those all need to be seamlessly built in one platform to have the maximum impact. As you said as well, it's like you can build AI algorithms all day long that come up with novel insights and spit out data, but don't really solve a very particular problem to the provider. And, and you have to think about workflow and, and all of those complexities. But when we can wrap the entire thing into one system, hardware, software, AI, you can make it really seamless. The AI output can be that delivered you know, on the device, right as it's in front of the patient, I think you get a different experience than you do if, if all those pieces are disconnected from each other or all owned by different companies or players. And so that's been a part of our strategy. We're definitely going to continue to keep that part of our strategy, owning the entirety of the system, um, because we think that delivers the best in class experience. We can build, we can make the UI a lot simpler. We can make the, you know, just the product experience from end to beginning. Uh, more seamless for the provider. And, and we think long-term, the clinical data will also show that it's better as well. When you can tune the sensor exactly the way you want it to be for that machine learning algorithm, when you can iterate on the sensing side as quickly as you can on the machine learning side as well, when both of those can be getting new capabilities every couple of years, I think you can move a lot faster than when you're kind of limited by by the hardware that's already on the market from other players. Yeah. Anytime you can vert, vert you know, that's what Steve Jobs was the king at that, right? Yeah. Owning that walled garden. Yeah. It, it, anytime you can vertically integrate, you're going to have a better customer experience. I don't think it's any different here. Well, I want to be sensitive to your time and get you out of here. Uh, I want to say a huge congratulations on the business you guys have built. This is, I know it's, you know, it's, uh, you guys have done a phenomenal job and I'm excited to watch you guys move forward and bring new applications for the technology to market and wishing you guys continued success. And thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. This was, this was great. And I know the audience, it'll be extremely well received. Uh, really happy to be able to feature the feature echo on the, on the show. So thank you again. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the chance to share a little bit of the story and thanks for the platform. Well, that's it for this episode of the bleeding edge of digital health. We'll catch you guys next time. And thanks for tuning in.